Hello, I'm Sami Zaydan. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your look at the world of business and economics. This week, from Africa to Antarctica, countries are grappling with extreme heat. What will the latest iteration of climate change cost the world's economies? I'm Umay Kulsum Sharif in Doha. Qatar's hosting of tourists after the World Cup. Can it be sustained long term? We find out. Modest fashion on the world's runways. We find out how this multi-billion dollar market has gone from niche to mainstream in just a few years. Millions of people across the world are being impacted by extreme weather. The record-breaking temperatures are the result of heat-trapped gases caused by burning fossil fuels, as well as by the El Nino weather phenomenon. Well, there's a sustained spell of dangerous heat in some regions, while others are facing torrential rains and floods. All of this impacting health, businesses and even costing lives. But for many, there's simply no escape from the impacts of climate change. As Lina Barclay explains. Heat waves which span continents, from the most visited cities in the world to not-so-famous towns and villages. Scorching temperatures are sparing no one, from globe-trotting tourists, daily wage workers to refugees, affecting the lives of millions. A desert city, such as Phoenix in the U.S. state of Arizona, is accustomed to hot weather, but the homeless are among the hardest affected. Temperatures have surpassed 43 degrees Celsius for a record-breaking 18 successive days. I, I cry all the time. I, I like yell at, yell at the heat <laughs> to like, like go away or, you know. Last year I had a heat stroke um, staying at the park. I woke up in an ice bath uh, at the hospital. So. Several African countries are also in the grip of blistering heat waves. Despite warnings to stay home, Abu Jama needs to work 10 hours a day in the sweltering heat in a cucumber field in Idlib province in Syria. We work under sun to ensure our income and to support our children. We take 6 liras per hour, meaning 60 liras per 10 hours, and we wear these clothes, a cap, and a cloth that protect our body from sunstroke. Children of families forced from their homes by the war in Syria have no school in their temporary shelters. It's too hot to play outdoors and too humid to stay in. So families spare some water to let them cool off. In Idlib, temperatures soared to 47 degrees Celsius this week, worrying older people such as Mariam Kero. We've been like this for five years. I swear these children are unable to go outside. Inside is extremely hot and outside is the same. The situation is dramatic. As the heat waves goes on, it's getting harder for people with no resources to cope with extreme weather. In the city of Agadez in Niger, temperatures soared to 47 degrees Celsius this week, taking a toll on people and their livestock. We don't understand this heat. It hurts people and animals. Sometimes we bring cows to sell them at the market, and because of the heat, the livestock can't stand up. The livestock get sick from the heat. In Asia, monsoon rain, floods and landslides are a threat. Experts warn, it's a world of extremes and the weather patterns are here to stay. Lina Abakle for Counting the Cost. But what has the cost of these scorching temperatures been on the world's economy? Well, let's have a look at some of the numbers then, published last October by Dartmouth College. According to the study, heat waves resulting from global warming have already cost the world economy $16 trillion dollars since the early 1990s. Despite being the lowest carbon emitting nations, the world's poorest are the ones suffering the most. They've lost 6.7% of their GDP per capita since the 1990s, whereas wealthy countries lost around 1.5% of GDP per capita due to the extreme weather. Well, joining me now from Oxford is Anthony Hobley. He's former chief executive officer at Carbon Tracker Anthony is currently the Senior Strategic Advisor at Inevitable Policy Response. It's a United Nations project for responsible investment. Good to have you with us. So first of all, how unprecedented have the extreme temperatures been this year that we're seeing all around the world? I mean, yes, I mean, it is shocking. I think they are 
unprecedented. Unprecedented in the context, I think, for the first time, we're seeing them reported as a global phenomenon. We, we've had many extreme weather events, particularly over the last few years. Um, you know, records seem to get broken, you know, every year or two, um, as we know. Um, we're talking about records being broken right across the world now that were only broken 24, 48 months ago um, in many places. I think what's unprecedented is we are seeing this reported as a global phenomenon, you know, from to from records being broken in Tokyo, in China, in Greece, in Rome, um, uh, in the United States. Why, Anthony? I is this all down or mostly down to climate change? Without a shadow of a doubt. I mean, the, the science of attribution that the climate scientists have now developed is showing with great certainty the connection between the you know, massively increased um, density of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere um, and the impacts on climate. It's putting more energy into the system. The global average temperature of the planet is now about 1.2% above pre-industrial levels. Hasn't been this warm in over 125,000 years. That's very worrying. So what does that mean for our targets? Are we on track to keeping the temperature rise to below 1.5 if we're already at 1.2? Are we on track for net zero carbon emissions by, I think it's 2050? Well, I think the destination is very clear. I mean, the work that the inevitable policy response does as a sort of policy forecast shows that, you know, there is now a dramatic amount of policy to decarbonize um, our energy system, our industrial systems, our you know, food and agricultural systems. And so we know where we're going. That destination now, I think, is, is you know, clear and beyond doubt. The question is, will we get there quickly enough? Will and, we have the speed that we need to get there? All right. And, and that, you, that, and you think, Anthony, let me jump in here, because you work with an initiative that's precisely helping with that kind of policy. Are we simply not phasing out fossil fuels quick enough? No, we're not. No, we're not. And um, I think we, you know, we need to go faster. You know, we are seeing the technologies that will eat into demand for those fossil fuels, that will pro provide the replacement for those fossil fuels, wind, solar, um, you know, and, and products that use them, such as electric vehicles and batteries, they're going up the S-curves at a fantastic rate, you know, much faster than that was predicted by the IEA for many years. And so we have to phase down fossil fuels and phase them out much faster than we're doing. You know, it's a, it's a sort of tale of two cities. On the one level, you know, we've got the technologies, they are emerging, we've got the money we need, what is lacking is the political will to go as fast as we need to do to phase out fossil fuels. Climate change could cost the African continent, for example, by 2040, 2 to 4% of its GDP. Who's going to pick up the bill for that? Is it going to be shared amongst the world or is it going to be the poorest countries left to their own devices? Well, I think it's critical that we do not leave uh, the poor countries to their own devices. I mean, the UN Secretary General um, has called on the world to double um, sort of finance to the developing world to help them with this. There's a lot of talk now about, you know, and, and progress, I think, some, some encouraging progress or at least early steps to encourage global institutions like the World Bank um, and the other multilateral development banks and national development banks to put more of their work and, and money and financing and focus on helping the global south decarbonize and also helping to finance their adaptation but again you know i think it's important to understand that it, it's not an either or you know we there's a lot of climate change locked in we're going to have to adapt the poorer countries in the world you know, are going to have less resources without help from the rest of the world to adapt there's the you know, the million dollar question here is, can we stabilise the climate system at a level where we can adapt? Well, it's been a brilliant discussion on a hot topic, no pun intended. All right, maybe there was one. Thanks so much, Anthony, for talking to us. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. The FIFA World Cup last year was a defining one for Qatar, bringing fans from all over the world and giving Doha a chance to present its culture and heritage. 
It boosted tourism in the country, as well as in neighbouring GCC nations. Um Kulsum Sharif has the story. The Football World Cup crowds have long gone, but Qatar is still receiving visitors months after. Qatar Tourism says the country has welcomed more than 2 million tourists so far this year. Thanks to its strategic location, with a free visa to more than 100 countries and hosting a series of international events. After spending billions of dollars on its infrastructure for the FIFA World Cup last year, experts say now is the time for Qatar to cash in. What Qatar is doing is very much showcasing its own unique uh, values and um, you know its unique offer and the there is a strong sporting legacy with Formula One now with the you know the FIFA World Cup and that's been carried through into the Asian uh, games as well so you can see that the you know they're very much trying to ensure that the legacy um, continues. The Football World Cup has reinvigorated an economy battered by the pandemic. The country hosted more than a million visitors during the tournament, and many also travelled to neighbouring countries. Some Gulf Cooperation Council member countries are planning a common visa, similar to the Schengen, that would allow visitors to move freely across the region. Analysts say the GCC stands to benefit from cross-border cooperation and not competition. The offer of Schengen visa to visitors would truly be a game changer for the GCC region. Um, instead of sort of being competitors, uh, destinations would be working and collaborating together to ensure that visitors can, you know, go from one country to another and that everybody benefits from tourism. The Arab Ministerial Council for Tourism has named Doha the Arab tourism capital this year. Qatar's vision for its future is also in line with the United Nations Sustainable Goals for 2030. It hopes to draw 6 million visitors a year during this year and increase tourism's contribution to its GDP from 7 to 12 percent. FIFA World Cup off its checklist and the billions spent on it have gone into infrastructure projects that come handy on what's next. Qatar's Vision 2030 as it focuses on diversifying its economy and income sources. Umikul Sum Sharif, Doha, for counting the cost. Now let's have a look at some GCC and Qatar tourism numbers. According to Euromonitor's travel forecast model, International arrivals to the GCC region this year are expected to exceed their 2019 levels. Arrivals are forecast to reach 53 million visitors with a spending capacity of $114 billion. Tourism in Qatar received a boost from hosting the FIFA World Cup with international arrivals of 2.1 million in 2022. Well, these visitors spent around $10.8 billion during their stay in the country. To find out more about the booming tourism sector in Qatar, Omakul Sum Sharif sat down with Qatar's Tourism Authority Chief Operating Officer Berthold Trenkel. She began by asking him how Qatar plans to keep the momentum of tourists after the World Cup. For us, obviously, it was a huge milestone as a country. For tourism, it also unleashed the development. If you think about the infrastructure that was ready, whether it's expansion of the airport, the new cruise terminal that came in, and then of course the whole public transportation. We also saw an immense growth in the hotel sector. Room capacity went up by nearly 40% in a very, very short period. So for us to keep the momentum is just to capitalize on the gain in reputation that obviously the destination got. We have much more interest when it comes to talking to tour operators and travel agencies around the world that previously were hesitant to sell or even to offer Qatar. And they're all now interested to put us, so to speak, if you want, on the shelf. Well, Qatar is against um, some very established tourist destinations within the region. You have Saudi with the religious tourism. You have Abu Dhabi with all the bling. Does Qatar take the sporting destination? We have a reputation to defend, if you want, as their sports events destination. And there's a lot more that will be added to that. 
But the second thing is we're really now pushing, I don't know if you've seen the news, that coming February we'll have the Web Summit come to this part of the world and will be the first Web Summit in the Middle region. So for us to expand kind of the MICE sector is another important thing. And then when it comes to competition, there's space for everyone. Everyone is in a slightly different position and is targeting different segments. For Qatar, we want to win first and foremost as a family-friendly destination, which is actually quite different from the other destinations you've just mentioned. So I think there's enough space. I'm given to understand there is the, the GCC nations are mooting for like a common visa. Will that be beneficial? So you have two elements here. One for us much more important was that the HEA program, which was again a product of the FIFA World Cup, will continue and is now in play as the e-visa for Qatar. But let's not forget, we already have 100 countries that are visa-free and that makes us the most open country in this region. So for the others to come now with a GCC, if you want coordinated visa, will just mean catch up for them, but we will continue to go ahead and will welcome more and more visitors from more and more countries than everyone else. You're offering visa-free entry for people from more than 90 countries. And as you said, you want Qatar to be a family destination. But is there a tourist profile? Like, are you welcoming the person seeking luxury or you're open to the average globe trotter? So obviously, tourism for Qatar and for Qatar tourism is not just a numbers game, as in maximizing the number of visitors. But it's more around, we're looking for above average spend. Yes, that will include luxury, which then perfectly matches the portfolio of hotels that we have. Family is demographics. But if you think about different families, a family from Europe, UK, France, Germany, they're probably coming here to experience the desert. So they're looking for adventure or they're looking in winter, especially for sun, sea and sand. Someone coming from India, they have a slightly different interest. They're probably more into shopping, uh, indoor experiences. You have two million visitors so far this year, and you say that's pretty good going. But are the investors following? And what's in it for an investor? So first, it's about satisfying the current investors. We've seen literally billions of reals being invested over the last five years into all the infrastructure that tourism has. So delivering returns for the existing investors is for us at the moment the number one priority, rather than looking for additional investments and expanding the capacity. The tourism sector is often facing criticism for not being sustainable enough. What does Qatar have to offer on that front? So there's probably there's two strategic uh, objectives that we have there. One, you mentioned sustainability. Sustainability for me at the highest level starts with things like zero plastic, uh, minimizing food waste. And then of course in this region, very, very important is also energy saving as in managing your electricity, which is linked because of the summer temperatures to uh, the air conditioning use. So we have different initiatives where we're working with the hotels trying to optimize these through go three goals. Now that's sustainability. I want to add one more that we're also adding to the, to the agenda here, which is often overlooked, accessibility. We are also launching a program to work with the hotels to make Qatar and specifically all the properties and also the major attractions in Doha very good when it comes to accessibility. And finally, do you see yourself uh, achieving the Vision 2030 goals for Qatar? I think we're well underway. You mentioned uh, that we've already achieved the 2 million mark, and this was only the half year. So I don't want to now say double the number for the year, but I think we're on a good trajectory towards hitting the 6 to 7 million goal. But now it is about converting this into equal commercial success. And that's why it's not just a numbers game of visitors. It's also a game of room nights. It's a game of in-destination spend. And that's why you asked, like, what type of profile of tourists do we want? It is winning against the right profile and attracting the right profile. So it's a much more complicated game. But I think overall, all indicators post-FIFA World Cup are pointing in the right direction. 
Make it stylish, make it modern, but make it modest. The so-called modest fashion revolution has gained global appeal since it first emerged in the 2000s. Social media and online retail have given it a major push. But what is modest fashion? Well, essentially, it describes a way of dressing for women who want to implement modesty regardless of their faith or culture. According to the 2022 State of the Global Islamic Economy report, modest fashion was valued at $277 billion and it's estimated to reach $311 billion by 2024. Spending on modest fashion increased in the key markets of Turkey, Malaysia, Pakistan and the Middle East. But it's also growing in the UK and USA. More and more Western fashion giants and luxury top brands are embracing this sector as it moves from niche to mainstream. Well, from the city of Granada in Spain's Andalusia region, I'm joined now by Alia Khan. Alia is the founder and chairwoman of the London-based Islamic Fashion and Design Council organization. Good to have you with us, Alia. So why Hi, Jeff, has... How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Why has modest fashion become such a big business? Is it becoming mainstream? I think it is becoming mainstream only because you're seeing the mainstream really, really embrace it in the way that they are, uh, which is nicely surprising for us, actually. Um, what was wonderful was in the early days, we saw DKNY do her Ramadan collection. Um, you know, we saw Dolce and Gabbana come out with their hijab and their abaya line. So all these big names, Victoria Beckham, Beckham was coming up with uh, ways to cover the head that matched the dress. So. All this was an ode to us, wasn't it? Um, and so then, of course, when that happens and you see Hollywood following suit and before you know it, you see it on the red carpet and that's how it becomes uh, popular for everyone. All right. Not only the red carpet, but TikTok. Over two billion views on TikTok for hashtag modest fashion have influencers, social media. They've been the driving force for this market. You know, social media kind of liberated us, if you will. Um, social media allowed us to communicate to each other on what we felt was elegant and what we felt was um, stylish and what we wanted uh, in our fashion world. Um, so you saw influencers coming up with hijab tutorials. Uh, you saw style influencers talking about how to put things together and still be modest. So they, they gave this, this level of uh, not only credibility, but um, sort of an, a, an elevation to the, the whole idea of dressing modestly and how beautiful it can be. So yeah, social media just moved worlds for this market. All right, as the big brands come in, as you're mentioning, is that also making it though more expensive to dress modestly, which you know, it's kind of ironic, I guess, to the, to the whole principle. <laughs> well, I mean, I think they're in tune to the fact that we are the most um, affluent demographic in the world. Um, just by numbers, we have the highest spending power. Uh, for fashion alone, it's, a, it's in the hundreds of billions. Um, so that's attractive to any brand, naturally. And um, I think they're, of course, um, tuning their work to that spending power. So yes, you will see those types of price tags, but that doesn't mean that it only has to be expensive. We do have choices. If you go to the high street, you'll find a lot of options. If you go to um, some of the, the sort of like the, 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 the lower cost stores, you'll find wonderful options. So you can mix and match and, and meet your budget no matter where that is. I assume there's still room for growth. Break down the projections for us and any challenges, you know, what's holding things back? More investment, more marketing? Yeah, investment is a big one. I think for any brand, it doesn't matter whether you're in the mainstream or in the modest uh, market. I think just investment in general is what's holding a lot of brands back, holding a lot of extremely talented creatives uh, from really coming to market as they should. So that's a huge one. But we're also seeing a lot of changes, Sammy. We're seeing huge changes in, in the world. So those that are catering to this market need to understand what works for this market and what buzzwords will likely turn this market off. So, um, you know, with, with the, the new ideologies and the new movements, um, there has to be a stop and pause 
on how this might also repel a huge market. Fantastic. It's been great talking to you. Love the discussion. Thank you so much, Alia. Thanks, Sammy. And that's our show for this week. But remember, you can get in touch with us via Twitter. Use the hashtag AJCTC when you do. Or drop us an email. Counting the cost at aljazeera.net is our address. There's more for you online at aljazeera.com slash CTC. That'll take you straight to our page, which has individual reports, links, and entire episodes for you to catch up on. That's it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Sami Zaydan from the whole team here. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next. <laughs>